Good evening, uh, members of council, staff, invited guests, and uh, uh, all other guests and public that are joining us this evening virtually and by Rogers. Uh, welcome to our uh, Wednesday, February 9th council meeting. Uh, we'll call the uh, meeting to order and start with the council commitment. We are grateful for the many gifts which have been bestowed on Penetanguishene and its citizens, including the gifts of freedom, opportunity, and peace that we enjoy. May we be worthy custodians of all that has been entrusted to us. We ask that all in attendance and those who could not be here assist us in promoting good government. May our decisions as members of council be enlightened and may we all be strengthened in our awareness of our duties and responsibilities. May we be granted the wisdom, the knowledge, will, and understanding to preserve the good fortune of the town for the benefit of all and to make good laws and wise decisions. Thank you. Going on to item four, the approval of the agenda. Uh, the, that the agenda of the regular council meeting of February 9th, 2022 be approved as presented. A mover and a presenter, please. Seconder. Councillor Mayat, Councillor LaRose, all in favor. And that is carried, thank you. Declaration of pecuniary interest, if anyone so has, may do so now or at the appropriate time. And number six, we will now move on to the employee recognition for years of service 2021. And I will pass that over to CAO Lees. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this evening, uh, what, we, uh, what we have put together is a little bit of a staff appreciation video. Um, we have, uh, in the year 2021, we have 14 of our employees uh, that included uh, town, library, as well as volunteer fire that, uh, you know, over the last uh, number of years have poured their heart and soul into this organization and this community uh, to really make it what it is today. Uh, so your worship with council's indulgence, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to have uh, a short little video uh, shown, and then when the video is uh, done, I'd like to just make a few more remarks and hand it back to you, Mayor LaRouche. So if we can uh, pull up the video um, and we'll, uh, we'll give council and the public and, and our staff a little uh, flavor of, what, uh, of who and, and how we're celebrating this year. community is the direct result of our valued Hi, I'm Jeff Lees, the Chief Administrative Officer for the Town of Penetanguishing, and I'm a firm believer that the successful growth of this community is the direct result of our valued employees. For that reason, it is with great pride that today we are honoring employees who are celebrating various career milestones, ranging from five years to 30 years across various departments. We have 140 years of service among 14 different employees. Service you do for our municipality does not go unnoticed. Myself as mayor and our community stand by you and are grateful for the years you have dedicated to making our community a great place to live. Each and every one of these long-standing employees are vital to our municipality and the community. They work tirelessly to ensure that the organization not only runs smoothly, but effectively. They're the forefront of the municipality, working through problems with residents and interacting with the public. They're a true representation of service excellence, regularly exemplifying the town's core values of honesty, professionalism, and empathy. These employees have become leaders in the organization who provide mentoring and guidance to others. They're committed to fostering an enjoyable work culture by bringing out the best in one another. Their dedication and commitment to the organization doesn't go unnoticed. The sacrifices being made to ensure a job well done is truly appreciated, especially knowing that these sacrifices often go beyond the day-to-day -day work life. They make personal and family sacrifices regularly to ensure the job gets done. On behalf of all staff, council, and the community within the town of Penetanguishene, I want to express our sincere congratulations for reaching this truly exceptional milestone in your professional career. We are truly blessed to have employees such as yourselves working for our organization. Th 
thank you, uh, thank you, Sarah, and thanks, uh, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I can assure members of council and the community that the video uh, actually looks a lot better when uh, the internet doesn't decide to play uh, play a few tricks on us. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, members of council as well as the community will have access to it. Uh, I, I think uh, really what what we wanted to articulate here is, uh, you know, the great work that our staff have done. I'm just going to ask for those that are with us and, and are able to and are comfortable. I know we have a number of folks uh, with us uh, this evening that were featured in the video, uh, and I'd like to ask them to turn their cameras on if that's uh, if that's okay. If uh, if you're able to and you're comfortable, um, I know some are are just by phone, and I know some may not have the functionality. But uh, if you do have the functionality and, and you're able to do that, uh, certainly we'd appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to name a few that I believe are with us this evening, and I, I hope I don't miss any. Um, uh, Cynthia Steger with the library. I believe I see Cynthia on the screen. Cynthia, can you just give a little wave? Right, hopefully everyone can see uh, Cynthia. Uh, I believe I saw Joseph Berlinbach. Uh, Joseph, can you give us a little? Great, thank you. Hi, Joseph. Uh, Jim McLaren, uh, and I'm not sure if Jim had uh, video functionality or not, but I know Jim uh, is with us this evening um, as well. I know Deputy Chief Pierre Genie is with us. Pierre, uh, hi, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Uh, Chris Puttycomb, I know a volunteer firefighter. I see Chris on the screen. Hi, Chris. Uh, who else? Uh, Sherry Desjardin, I believe, is with us, although I believe she's uh, having some camera difficulties. Uh, she has for a few days, but Sherry is with us as well, and I'm just seeing that her camera's off. So, um, And I believe that's it. I, I don't know if I've missed anyone. I, I know there was a few others that were hoping to join that maybe, that maybe weren't able to. Um, and... Uh, Oh, I see someone uh, maybe. Oh, there's Connie Cabrera with the library. Hi, Connie. Great. All right. Good stuff. I hope I haven't missed anyone. Uh, members of council and the community, um, you know, really, as I said, this is this is an opportunity, particularly with COVID, uh, to commemorate and celebrate the accomplishments of our staff. As we uh, mentioned, it's 140 years of service amongst 14 different employees, you know, ranging right from five to 30, as we saw. Um, you know, a tremendous accomplishment in itself, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, for all the hard work that they've done over the years. Uh, we also took an opportunity this year to uh, celebrate and, and commemorate uh, one of our very own uh, volunteer firefighters that we lost, uh, and certainly uh, a, a, a tremendous 30 years that uh, Mr. Marshall provided. Every one of these employees have received a certificate of appreciation from the mayor on behalf of council as well as a little token of appreciation uh, for their years of service. And I really just can't, uh, you know, on behalf of council and senior team and, and the staff, as well as community as, as a whole, I really can't uh, thank each and, each and every one of you enough. So, so thank you very much. Uh, a big round of applause for everyone uh, that uh, is celebrating and, and accomplished all those years of service. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, I recognize and, and acknowledge the great work that staff behind the scenes did pulling together this video, uh, particularly in these COVID times. So thank you uh, to our communications staff, uh, Stacey and Sarah. Your Worship, that's what I wanted to share with uh, this particular item, and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Jeff. And as I iterated earlier, uh, it was my pleasure to be able to present the certificates on behalf of Council to all these uh, employees of the municipality. And once again, on behalf of council and myself, I'm sure we thank you very much for all your years of service. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will move on to deputations and presentations. And first we have a presentation from Jeffrey Abrams of Principles of Integrity, Re-Integrity Commissioners 2021 annual report. Welcome, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, actually, uh, through the mayor. Uh, Hi, Janice. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Janice Atwood, and I'm going to be doing the speaking tonight. Uh, we try to mix it up a little bit just to keep it interesting. So um, I, we won't take a lot of your time this evening, but thank you very much for um, taking the time to have us uh, speak with you. Um, Jeff and I together are the partners of Principles Integrity, and we are your integrity commissioners. And uh, this is uh, really a, a council recognition in a way. This report is a good news story, we think, for council. Um, 
this is our second report to, to you. We call it annual report, but we're not, not right bang on the 12 months, you can see. Uh, particularly with the pandemic, it's sort of uh, stretched over a, a longer period of time. But in any case, um, one of the things we like to do in our annual report is uh, just uh, remind council and really the public um, of the role of an integrity commissioner and uh, how an integrity commissioner uh, functions. So an integrity commissioner is an independent uh, accountability officer that uh, municipalities are required to have. And we are available to help uh, uh, provide advice on shaping the policy, uh, the ethical policy documents that you have. You have uh, a code of conduct, which we assisted uh, in developing back at the beginning of our appointment. And we're available to provide education and training for members of council and members of local boards. Uh, we're available to provide confidential advice to individual members if they encounter uh, a gray area, some issue that arises that they want a little advice on. Um, that's an important role for the integrity commissioner. Um, and it is confidential binding advice that we are able to give to members of council. So uh, they can feel quite confident in how they uh, proceed if they uh, are relying on that advice. Uh, and the um, function that the public thinks most often of is our um, administration of complaints. So um, if we get a complaint, we go through a process of reviewing to determine if it's within our jurisdiction, and if it is within our jurisdiction, we will investigate. If we're able to resolve a matter, uh, we can uh, resolve it without a need for a public uh, report to council. Um, if it's not able to be resolved through course correction, then we will bring a report to council. So we have um, in, your, in the report before you tonight, you will see we categorize our, uh, the uh, areas of work that we provide for you and under the area of uh, advice, we have responded to four requests for advice over the course of uh, this past uh, sort of year plus of the retainer. And those are, um, we were able to help members of council with issues that uh, come up with respect to uh, gray areas that they deal with as there are a conflict or uh, something of that nature that they want some advice on. So we do that in writing and they have our confidential binding advice so that if there were ever uh, a complaint, uh, it would not uh, be able to proceed. Uh, in terms of um, administering complaints, uh, we only had one complaint uh, during this most recent, uh, recent period covered by this uh, report. Uh, and that matter was able to be resolved without need for uh, a full investigation and, and recommendation report to council. And that's certainly uh, one of the advantages uh, uh, in uh, how the integrity commissioner can administer um, complaints, assisting members of council uh, with uh, course correction where uh, it's possible and resolving matters uh, so that um, it's uh, basically able to be resolved without a public report and, and uh, the complainant is then advised of how it's being resolved um, and the um, member is, uh, uh, you know, benefits from that guidance uh, that they get. So we, one of the things we like to cover off in our reports is um, just a little glimpse of other matters that are occurring around the province from our vantage point, not only um, serving over 40 municipalities uh, as we do, but also uh, keeping abreast of uh, issues um, that arise for uh, other integrity commissioners and uh, before other councils. We're able to provide you with a little bit of a, uh, a glimpse of uh, the other issues that seem to arise frequently. And so we've just uh, spoken to a few of those in the report. Um, one, of course, is the issue of uh, uh, disparagement, and that's sort of a, a theme that arises um, not infrequently around um, municipalities in Ontario, where uh, differences uh, devolve into uh, statements of disrespect or disparagement, uh, and that, of course, uh, is always problematic. And so we encourage members to always uh, 
recognize that although um, differences of opinion are always uh, welcome, that's the cornerstone of our, democ our democracy, um, certainly it's important to maintain decorum in uh, whatever medium uh, you're engaging in. Um, we, uh, another area that uh, frequently arises uh, and provides uh, issues for members is conflict of interest. And so we, uh, we think your code of conduct provides excellent guidance uh, in terms of setting out how to recognize uh, when you may have an interest in a matter and how to manage that so that you will not be in a conflict of interest. And of course, if you have questions, uh, we're always available to uh, assist you with those. Um, certainly one of the takeaways from the uh, last year's um, judicial inquiry, which reported out, um, I think it's a, a year ago now, actually, um, uh, when uh, Associate Chief Justice Morocco provided his recommendations to the province. Uh, and the uh, recommendations that the Associate Chief Justice provided with respect to identifying and recognizing disqualifying interests uh, reflects uh, exactly uh, the provision that you have in your code of conduct. So you're very well positioned in terms of uh, what uh, the, the uh, province is likely to move towards uh, when it wraps its arms around that issue. Um, an issue that arises from time to time is when members of council stray outside of their lane and uh, we uh, talk about uh, members needing to stay in their lane and not get into the weeds of uh, trying to take the, the reins of administration, trying to manage issues. Uh, of course, uh, members have a, a responsibility to be responsive to constituents, but there's a handoff. And so we encourage members to always be mindful of that handoff and um, hand the reins over to staff to be actually dealing with operational matters and administrative matters. Um, and finally, uh, there's an issue that, that seems to be arising uh, around the province uh, with some frequency, and that is conduct on social media. And I think uh, probably there was a time not very long ago, perhaps three or four years ago, when if we'd spoken about use of social media, people's eyes would have glazed over. But with this pandemic has really come a huge wave of uh, participation on social media. And so it's really the exception rather than the rule uh, for uh, virtually everybody to be engaging at some point uh, on social media. So we, we do encourage um, our municipal clients to think about adopting uh, some kind of policy guidance to assist members of council, just to provide some guidance as to how they engage on social media, because for some it's, a, it's quite a new um, arena and can give rise to uh, uh, issues that uh, concern constituents. Uh, we recommend, for example, that uh, members uh, recognize that they shouldn't arbitrarily block people from social media simply because they're disagreeing in a conversation that is uh, revolving around a, a topic of public interest. Um, but that there is an obligation to curate if you're on social media uh, and remove uh, some of the very offensive things that might end up finding themselves there. So there's a bit of sort of a double-edged sword on that. And it's, as I say, I think four or five years ago, this would have been almost a, a topic that most people would just not pay a lot of attention to. But now really it's, it's virtually the exception rather than the rule. Everybody is engaging a little bit in social media and it's probably timely for uh, municipalities to think about having some kind of uh, policy that helps them to guide their members to not uh, get into the shoals and, and run into difficulties. Certainly the next iteration of elected officials will be uh, perhaps not the next iteration, but over the next few years, we're going to see a lot more use of social media and it will be a lot more prevalent than it even is now, if that's possible. 
Um, we're available to answer questions, uh, if any. Um, otherwise, we we do think that um, other than the fact that we we don't hear an awful lot from members, we take that as a very good thing, that things are functioning the way they should. And when you need us, we're here for you. So we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Janice. Members of council, do any one of you have uh, questions through to Janice or Jeffrey? It does not appear so. So Janice, Jeffrey, thank you very much for your presentation and well done as usual. Thank you. Thank you. You have a good evening, Your Honor. Okay, with that, we will move on to be the next presentation, which is a presentation from Police Services Board Chair Brian Cummings and Detachment Commander Joe Evans. So Brian and welcome, Joe. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, as you. Chair of the Police Services Board, um, it's my pleasure to present the 2021 uh, annual report on behalf of the board. I will have a short presentation, then I'll turn it over to Inspector Evans for the operational side of uh, this year. Um, so if we can get uh, the slides up, Sarah. Just one moment, I'm pulling them up now. All right, thank you. The service board really did a lot of work this year and I'm really happy with uh, how it turned out, uh, how we've had such good cooperation from town staff uh, on what's been going on the whole year. It's been busy rewriting uh, policy. Yeah, we're close. There we go. All right, <clears throat> after establishing all the board's goals and objectives for 2021, the board hit the ground running. We started to complete um, a new uh, rules and procedures manual. Uh, there was a thorough review done and it hasn't been done since 2012. So there was quite some uh, handsome changes to that particular manual uh, with cooperation of staff, we were able to, can you go to the next slide, Sarah, please? That's good, thank you. With the um, cooperation of the town staff, we saw an overhaul of our police services uh, page on the town website. So now there's a lot of information that's available to the public uh, regarding PSB. Um, and I encourage people to look at it when they get the time. There's a lot of information that's good information. Um, we expanded most of our training opportunities this year. We were able to um, put board and staff uh, through some Police Association of Ontario, the Ontario Association of Police Service Boards, uh, Area 3, and an annual virtual conference, and the Canadian Association of Police Governance, uh, where there was a virtual conference for that. Um, as you're aware, there was a submitted uh, joint proposal with the South Georgian Bay Detachment Municipalities, Town of Penetanguishene, Midland, Township of Tiny, Tay, and the District of Muskoka for the new composition um, of our a board, uh, pardon me, a detachment board. Um, and it was um, sent to the Solicitor General for the Community Safety and Policing Act legislation that is was 200, 2019 but as yet, we have yet to see any information on it. So it has not yet been passed. Um, and we've had the formal appointment and the hiring of our detachment commander, uh, Joe Evans, uh, that took place earlier this year. Next slide. The board expanded the uh, detachment commander's performance review. It was kind of a basic review. Um, we've expanded it so that it is more in line with um, the board's goals and objectives. Uh, that was really important to some of the board members. Um, we had a steering committee that was formed. And again, with the help of staff, uh, they developed a new education, training and professional development policy that was added to our rules and procedures manual. 
and it was approved by the board at a special meeting in January uh, this year and is now going to be implemented. Uh, we had Chief Superintendent Dwight um, Peer attend our uh, September 13th meeting. Uh, he was to give us an update on what was going on around Ontario uh, and some difficulties and challenges that are happening. And we had a couple of board members who um, went to an annual virtual conference for the Canadian Police uh, Governance. Uh, next slide, please. Our Area 3 um, Police Service Advisor, Gd Sahoda, uh, attended our December 8th meeting and provided a little bit of an update of what her position is and how it relates to um, our board and what it, what it, it does within the Ministry of the Solicitor General. Um, she was not unable to provide a lot of updates as to what's going on with these new um, joint boards. However, uh, she said it's in the works. Um, there was a presentation from Kathy Willis of the Huronia Transitional Homes to commemorate the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. She gave us a great presentation at our December meeting. And we, um, you, as council is probably aware, we sent a letter to the attorney general to bring awareness of the alarming rates of recidivism, which are affecting the OPP and how they do their business. This letter was also sent to all the municipalities of Ontario and to the attention of the board chairs for their support. So far, we've had some great responses. And lastly, the last slide, please, sir. These are the members that made it happen. I would like to thank, take this opportunity to thank all the members of the Police Services Board for all the hard work that they've done in the past year. I would send a special thank you out to Phil De Bruyne, who unfortunately resigned from the board in December as he takes on a teaching role position. However, he was a tremendous help in updating the board policies and procedures and in developing the education training and professional development policy. Thank you for all your hard work and we wish you all the best in your teaching endeavor. Now I will turn it over to Inspector Evans for the operational side. Thanks, uh, Councillor Cummings, uh, your worship. Uh, Deputy Mayor Dubot and, uh, and Council Member. Thanks for having me up uh, and uh, allowing me to go over the 2021 20, uh, annual report uh, for the OPP and I'll, I'll bring you up to speed. And, and um, from some of the remarks from last year, uh, we've also changed the annual report somewhat so that it'll give you a five year view of things that are going on and allow me to speak to trends. Uh, that uh, that I'm sure you're all aware of uh, that we've been in COVID for 24 plus months now. Um, moving actually, yeah, closer closer uh, to starting our three years. So <clears throat> if we can, um, Sarah, can you bring this up? Uh, do you have a copy of the annual report? Just one moment. I'm sorry. Yeah, she's Martin just going to bring it up now. Okay. Oh, well, thank you, Stacey. And when you just go to page two of that document when it comes up. There just seems to be some restrictions on the document. Um, I'm not sure if you have it handy and you can share your own screen or if Stacy, maybe you have better luck with it. No, I've just got a hard copy here. I'm sorry. Um, normally, uh, Nicole sends that out so that we can be. Just one moment. Okay. I'll, I'll also see if I can uh, I can get it up and share with my screen. Just just one. I think I can here, Stacey. I'll maybe try. Oh, okay, okay, perfect. I got Thanks. it right here. So awesome. There we go. Appreciate the help there, CAO. 
Okay, yes. Uh, so we'll be on the, on, we're going to be starting with what's new. So as uh, Chair Cummings has advised, uh, I was appointed to the 9th of August uh, to the Detachment Commander of Southern Georgia Bay, and I appreciate the support that I've received in, in this role uh, over my last uh, two years as Interim Commander and then now as the, uh, the Commander. Uh, staffing development uh, at Southern Georgia Bay, as you know, uh, we don't develop our people, um, we don't get better. So I have had uh, officers uh, being developed out around uh, the province and over the last two years with COVID, um, being the third largest detachment in central region, uh, Southern Georgia Bay at 102 members, um, uh, we, uh, we are we are looked to uh, to support in other areas uh, for investigations and otherwise um, being asked for officers from the front line. This is good and bad. This is good for the officers that are going, but it's bad um, with some of the things that have happened around the province. Uh, we've had uh, police shootings and so on where uh, people are off work and we have to uh, support. So I've had officers up in Northeast region, so up around North Bay, um, to support up there um, for, for uh, approximately six months, which takes from our own area. And this happens as, um, you know, these things occur that we have to uh, kind of just move, uh, move from one area to the other to support. What I've done just recently, though, uh, due to um, the fatigue that's going on with officers is I've, I've uh, denied any, any further extension to that. And I've brought all my officers back. Um, so um, that, that was a necessity just because uh, we've, we've been running at a steady pace of our minimum manning, uh, which is approximately eight officers in our area, which gives us our minimum officers per location. And the officers are, are fatiguing with the calls for service and uh, the amount of pressure and the change in the environment of working uh, during this COVID pandemic and how they're being treated and so on and so forth, which I'll get into maybe a little bit later. Um, so the COVID pandemic, uh, officers uh, have remained vigilant throughout this pandemic, uh, assisted in many areas of the OPP, as I just said. Um, some of the challenges that we looked at, uh, and I've mentioned some officer fatigue, um, and this is, this is happening just due to the sheer calls for service and um, working at the minimum uh, amount of officers on the road and, and just, just enough time to get their holidays in. And a lot of people carried their holidays over from last year because of uh, the requirement and the demand due to policing across the province. As everybody knows what's going on right now in Ottawa, they might know what's going on in the West Region with uh, the Ambassador Bridge. They might know what's going on in the West Region with the, uh, with the bridge that's um, uh, Blue Water Bridge. Um, also, we've got officers tied up in all these locations. Toronto's uh, having um, different protests um, that we are getting, we're getting ordered to go down to, uh, as well as Peterborough, uh, City of Quartha Lakes. So we're having a lot of these issues and um, we, uh, we're sending officers to assist in those areas. So that's, that's fatiguing the officers because they're not getting any days off when they're on, when they're off they're off uh, working overtime in these other areas. Uh, we, uh, we heard the Councillor Cummings mentioned recidivism, um, that that is still ongoing. I was just at the courts today dealing with, uh, with that as well and seeing where that stands. And I believe that's moving forward with meetings with, uh, with MAG, the Minist Ministry of the Attorney General. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're working away at that to help because all we've been doing is uh, if I, if I can uh, use the term we're chasing our tail, that's what it feels like in some, in over the last year, year and a bit, where we arrest, we charge, we invest, well, sorry, we investigate, we, we write papers, we charge, we put them before the courts, they come back out, we do the same thing all over again with the same people. So we're just chasing our tail. Um, so anyways, that, uh, my decision to bring the officers back. So we had as many officers as we can on the front line here in Southern Georgian Bay, uh, it was paramount to me and that's why I've done it uh, just over. So um, that was at the beginning of the year. So my officers will be coming back at the end of this month. Uh, my last officers will be coming back. So 
I think I've got one coming back in April. And during the same time, we've had lateral transfers. Uh, I think I've had three that have gone off to Heronia West uh, due to the location of where they live. That's understandable, which is now giving me um, openings here. But as of Friday, we had six uh, new recruits that have graduated that have come to Southern Georgia Bay. So uh, that, that'll be uh, tying us up for the next uh, three to four months as we start getting them trained up so they can be on their own uh, during the day. So that, that uh, ties up six officers as well, but it's, uh, it's a necessary evil to have those officers up and running as soon as possible. So if we go to the next, uh, the next page, please. Uh, I think it's uh, Jeff. Yeah, thank you very much. So this goes into the crime uh, stats just for Penetanguishing, and, and there's your five-year uh, picture uh, for break and enters. You can see that we're we're not as good as uh, we could be. Uh, there's 17 over 2021, but 2017 looks a little bit a little better. And again, since since 2017, 2018 uh, is when we amalgamated with Midland and uh you know what there's uh so there's been an increase in officers but again like i said the staffing's kind of all over the place and we're trying to uh get that steadied somewhat uh looking at thefts of motor vehicles there's seven uh theft from theft from motor vehicle is 24 uh assaults 44 that's not including waypoint or cncc um with mischiefs, we're sitting at 32. That's also uh, the type of damage done to vehicles. A lot of that is vehicles uh, that are that are uh, locked and they're broken into. That's a mischief. Um, alarms, 57. Uh, 911 call, 74. Uh, impaired care control, that's six. And calls for service totaling 40, uh, almost 34, uh, 3,500, uh, just up from uh, 2020. Uh, next, please. Now uh, you'll see your clearance rates of uh, 54. And again, if you look at 27 down, it looks like it's uh, it's going down, but there's also more calls for service. So uh, with penetanguishing, uh, this, sorry, this is strictly penetanguishing. And you'll see that um, so the property crime is at 13.8. Again, it's all call related um, for these uh, percentages, of course, a drug crime at 62.5. And next, please. The crime clearance rates uh, for the detachment as a whole is at 44%, so a little bit lower again than what uh, you are in penetanguishing. Crime, uh, property crime is about the same and drugs are just down a bit. Move ahead, please. Next, we'll be looking at the motor vehicle accidents for penetanguishing. Uh, sadly, there you'll see one fatality there for the gray is the four, uh, four um, 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 gee whiz, I'm losing it here. Um, one is for, for the fatality, four is for personal injury, and the 51 is property damage. And then if you go to the next one, you'll see is the detachment as a whole and how it sits. And uh, you see that there's there's quite a bit more uh, with six fatalities, seven, three PIs or personal injuries, and uh, five uh, of just over 500 property damage accidents. So we're we're back in the, and you can see the you can almost see the the difference of when the vehicles came back in uh, the lockdowns um, opened back up from from COVID even though we had a couple during 2021 2020 was primarily locked down and you can see the difference in the accidents. Uh, however, there was more fatalities, um, but uh, that's just bad luck on on uh, a lot of parts. Uh, we do our best to patrol the highways and keep them safe, uh, but we can't be everywhere all the time. So you can see the difference in 2021 when the open when it opened back up, and then we have more accidents due to that. Uh, next, please, Jeff. Just moving into uh, the charges now, and you can see um, even with the reduction of calls, you can see where the fatigue and the, the reduction of officers on the front line will make a difference. And I'll show you where. So we've done a couple of uh, initiatives in seat belts. You'll see 38 over 25. Um, believe me, there's a lot more than 38 people uh, that, 
that drove around in 2021 without their seatbelt on. Speeding, there's uh, we're 200, we're 200 down. That uh, that uh, would connect directly to the amount of officers that are patrolling and doing radar patrol um, when we're out and about. So if you're missing four officers off the front line because they're out in other areas or we don't have them because they've transferred out, well, that's a car that's not on the road that's doing radar. Uh, distracted driving, again, we, we've, uh, we've done initiatives to stop people and get them off their cell phone. You can see that it's more than doubled uh, from 2020. Again, there was more traffic on the road, but every time I was in my personal vehicle, being a truck, and I'd be driving around, I'm looking down into uh, people's vehicles and they're on their cell phones, uh, texting away while they're driving. Um, so um, I had an initiative, two initiatives actually done uh, throughout 2021, and that is the reason for that higher number. Impaired's at 19, that sounds good. It's down from 103. I know that's incorrect. I've ran this a couple of times. I've had Nicole to run it a couple of times. And this is just the uh, the machine, the big OPP machine that that uh, spits out the numbers. And, and it's been consistent on 19. So I'm not sure exactly uh, where we're missing, uh, where we're missing our other ones. But if you look at in parrots, and then you go down to the bottom where it says ADLS suspensions, there's 73 suspensions. Well, every time there's an impaired, there's a suspension. Um, now there's other ADLS suspensions that aren't necessarily impaired, but usually not that far off. So that's why I know that there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. But going back to the total big four charges, uh, there's uh, 3,269 charges, which is uh, about 300 less than 2020. Um, other highway traffic act, HTAs, just over 800. Uh, other CC, criminal code, 441. And other charges, including insurance act and, and uh, drugs and stuff that are come from motor vehicles is 837. So a total violations of uh, just over, or uh, just under rather, 5,900. Uh, your arrests are down by about 200 from 2020. Uh, ADLS suspensions at 73, down from 98. Uh, traffic stops are down by about 400. Um, and again, that speaks directly to the amount of resources we have on the road. Um, uh, patrol hours, you can see that it's down almost 5,000 hours there. And the court hours are down just because court was... Uh, and that's one of the problems with recidivism is the courts were closed for so long. So officers could not uh, be in court. And now um, just uh, just before Christmas, I, I purchased two laptop computers. So that's how the officers are doing court. Now they come in, they, they're in a quiet room and uh, they're given their evidence over a computer, similar to what I'm doing here with you folks uh, virtually. So the courts are starting to click, kick back up again. And so you'll see that. Uh, that number increased quite uh, quite a bit for next year. And next, please. So just as of today, we received uh, the auxiliary program, which uh, was stood down in March 2020, just because of uh, uh, the pandemic and having to wear PPE all the time. So why would we have somebody in our car, or the officers, um, for 12 hours wearing a face mask? So. Um, it reduces the amount of oxygen level and so on, and it's fatiguing to the officers. Um, this is a lot harder on, um, and as you people know, if you can imagine wearing a mask all day long and talking to people, when you're talking louder to project your voice and so on, that, that all uh, equates to burning energy and, uh, and fatiguing the officers. So um, we stopped uh, having the auxiliaries in the detachment, although they're a, a a total asset to every detachment across the province it's we could not have people doubling up in cars so that was stopped uh provincial uh provincially in march 2020 and as of this afternoon uh we we received orders from command that we can have the auxiliaries back in and doing uh, helping us with community however not permitted to double up in our car on our cruisers uh, for safety. Um, so as you know, the auxiliaries, they, uh, they take uh, great pride in their community policing initiatives and the projects. They assist us in regular patrol, which they can't do right now. Um, 
hopefully in, in short order. Uh, crime and disaster scenes, they can, they can help us uh, secure those. Large gatherings or parades for crowd and traffic control and motor vehicle collisions, they can help us on the scene just to ensure that we have uh, secure scene safety. Let's move on, please. Moving on to our, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, our Marine unit. Uh, pride, pride of the uh, the province, uh, the Southern Georgian Bay Marine Units, full time Marine Unit with four members, total thirteen members, but four full time. And then what I do is, uh, since I came here and uh, owning a vessel myself and being out in the water and seeing the shenanigans that was out there, I would much rather see someone get arrested or charged for um, what they were doing. Uh, than having to give somebody a notification that their family member is not returning. So I increased um, our vessels on the water every weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And with that came, uh, I think, 16 impairments last year and 13 license suspensions. This year, you can see what that did. Uh, if you look at the bottom bullet, there was 159 calls for service, and it included one impaired charge and one suspension. So they, uh, even when the even when the Marine officers would pull over boats, they would be told that, no, 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 we heard last year that you guys are non-forgiving out here. So we're, uh, we're playing by the rules, which is exactly what I wanted in the first place. So again, uh, kudos to uh, the, the team here. Um, it, uh, that again, when I put officers out there in the weekend, it's taking from the road, um, trying to keep down the cost down uh, for uh, frontline policing. So otherwise it, it goes to overtime and, and it's just added money. Uh, over to the next, please. And we'll go to our MSVs, which were motorized, motorized snow vehicles, which are, which are back uh, on the trails now uh, with the, the good trail conditions that we had. Um, so we have approximately, for anybody that doesn't know, 200 kilometers of groomed trails, OFSC. Uh, trails and officers uh, respond as well to all other lakes, frozen lakes or waterways that we have here. So it's Georgia Bay, Six Mile and several other inland lakes. Um, we've already been quite busy. I think we've only got one in Parrot this year off the uh, off the sleds so far. Um, but um, LLA, Liquor License Act tickets, and uh, you can see, I think in the second paragraph there, you'll see 148 calls for service logged 556 hours of, uh, of um, patrol in 2021 and numerous rides. Along with the sleds, what we do is we'll put cruisers on, uh, on the end of uh, trailheads and we'll do speed enforcement right there. So they're coming towards the cruisers anyway. So we just uh, shoot out with the radar and, and uh, charge them as you know, the maximum speed is 50 kilometers an hour on a trail, which is for these snowmobiles nowadays is just a little burp of the throttle. So, uh, but anyways, we've got, again, we've got quite a few officers. We rotate them through to make sure that uh, they are getting out in the sleds were visible. I received many uh, thanks from the snowmobile clubs in the area last year, all from Georgia Bay uh, Township, all the way down in, in to, uh, uh, throughout Tiny. And to say thank you for our visibility because it really reduced. We had three fatalities last year, all in the water. Um, and even with uh, people doing puddle jumping and stuff, we got out there last year trying to uh, avoid that and prevent it, if you will. And um, um, we weren't always successful, but I got to tell you, uh, there wasn't any more uh, deaths after the original three. So we're happy with that. And uh, lastly, before we go, where are we going from here? Well, we're, we're starting, uh, we're finishing up on our detachment action plans from 20 to 22. So we'll be, uh, we'll be starting to rewrite uh, on a new strategic plan or building on the strategic plan that we have. Uh, we've had the one community safety and well-being meeting uh, already for 2022, and that's going to be going to the next level um, with North Simcoe. And we're going to continue with our community engagement education. So I asked my officers for three things. I asked them for traffic engagement, I don't ask them to write tickets. I ask them to engage in traffic, uh, traffic enforcement and engagement. I ask them to get out and do community engagement, uh, which is foot patrol and talking to the communities. And I ask them for crime engagement, anything to crime to investigate it thoroughly and hold the people or find the people and hold them to account. And that's, uh, that's what I expect from Southern Georgia Bay officers. And they've been doing their very best over the last year, 2021, and we'll continue to do that. 
And that's my submission to your worship. Uh, Councillor Cummings and uh, <clears throat> Inspector Evans, uh, I'm sure I'm, uh, on behalf of Council and certainly myself, uh, we thank you very much for a very precise and informative uh, presentation and well, well done and well appreciated. Uh, do any members of Council have any questions through to uh, Councillor Cummings or Inspector Evans? There appears not. So again, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So with that, we will move on to the adoption of minutes not already confirmed. And uh, that is that the following minutes of council meetings be confirmed and adopted as circulated council meeting of January 12, 2022 and special council meeting of January 12, 2022, a mover and a seconder. Councillor LaRose and Deputy Mayor Dubo, do anyone have any questions or concerns with these minutes? There being none, all in favor. That is carried, thank you. A consent agenda, we have none. Matters for consideration, A, a verbal update from the Chief Administrative Officer re COVID-19 municipal impacts. And so with that, I'll pass it over to our CAO. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'll be uh, relatively brief and certainly as always, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, this is the second update for 2022 uh, that I've provided to members of council as well as the community. Uh, there's a number of uh, changes that the province uh, implemented uh, that started right from uh, January uh, 31st. A uh, number of changes took place uh, right through to uh, February 21st is the next kind of phase, if you will, of, uh, of openings that the province has uh, enacted or uh, lifting of restrictions, if you will. And of course, the last phase of that, which everyone is aware of is March the 14th. Um, so it's a gradual phase uh, that the province has, has enacted. And uh, certainly there's a lot of components to each of those, uh, some of which affect uh, us in the municipal world uh, to, a great, to, to, to a great deal, uh, the ones that are in place now. And certainly that just continues to lift and, and allow the municipality to uh, expand our services uh, from predominantly from a recreation facility perspective. Um, so that's kind of what the province has been up to. The, the other thing I would mention is just hot off the press today, as I'm sure many people saw, the province made an announcement that they are expanding access to free rapid tests for the general public. Uh, they're gonna be distributing 5 million rapid tests each week for the next eight weeks. Uh, through pharmacies, as well as grocery locations, as well as another 500,000 each week through community partners in vulnerable communities. Uh, in total, um, 44 million rapid tests over the, uh, over the next uh, several weeks that they're making available. From a public health perspective, uh, the public Simcoe Muskoka District Health through Dr. Gardner uh, has uh, lifted the letter of instruction that was put in place on November 23rd, 2021. Uh, it was uh, dated and it did run uh, counterintuitive to what uh, OREG 36420 articulates, which is the, the, the uh, current regulatory framework that we're operating under uh, from a provincial standpoint. Um, the, the other thing I would add is that the local vaccination clinic continues to operate uh, here in Penetang Machine on Tuesdays. They've reduced their hours or amended their hours, I should say. Uh, to now be from 11.30 to six o'clock. Uh, they were finding that there weren't a lot of uh, requests for appointments beyond six o'clock. So they've adjusted that to meet the demands of the community. And certainly it's, uh, it's a great thing for our community here in Penetang Machine and North Simcoe as a whole. From a town perspective, um, our museum and our arena have reopened at 50% capacity as of January 31st. We still require proof of vaccination through the QR code. Uh, we still have our staff uh, at our various facilities in our teams or our, co our cohort model, if you will. Uh, and that's gonna be reevaluated at our next control group meeting on the 22nd of February. We are still operating by appointment only and we, we are still closed at town hall, uh, the fire hall and public works admin uh, for lunch hour from 12 until one. 
From a business continuity perspective, there's a number of things that continue to be in place here at the municipality and our various facilities. Uh, predominantly, as I noted, our teams, uh, our teams and cohort model. Uh, we've had situations where we've had to, you know, work very collaboratively with our union and redeploy staff uh, to ensure that service levels were not compromised. Uh, and certainly, we still continue to provide that high level of service remotely. I'm proud to say that um, it's. Uh, uh, it's been quite some time uh, since I've uh, had any complaints from a service level perspective. In fact, lots of compliments that uh, services uh, and the, the offerings uh, continue to be seamless for the general public. Uh, last piece uh, with respect to the Penetanguishing Public Library. Uh, library staff is also in a Teams model until February 22nd. Their hours remain nine to five, Monday, Tuesday, Friday. 10 to 6 Wednesday and Thursday, and 9 to 2 on Saturdays. Uh, they did have some capacity and restrictions lifted on January 31st, as well as they are requiring proof of vaccination, which is a provincial requirement. Generally speaking, at our facilities, we are, we've removed our contact tracing, uh, but we still do have our, our active uh, screening in place, which is a requirement. For uh, vaccination numbers continue to be healthy, uh, not only in Simcoe Muskoka, but also uh, provincially. I think they are seeing a bit of a plateau, uh, but certainly, as everyone has noticed, public health continues to put a pretty solid uh, campaign together in terms of, uh, you know, encouraging folks to get uh, to get the jab, if you will. Uh, with that, uh, Your Worship, uh, I, the, the last thing I would just add is uh, certainly the message from, from public health. Uh, still is one of uh, needing to exercise caution. Um, you know, while we while we are starting to see things lift, uh, definitely uh, from public health's perspective, uh, uh, we've seen a high rate of mortality. The hospital system still remains to be fragile. Unfortunately, we had five uh, children deaths in Simcoe Muskoka in the month of January. A high number of outbreaks, and certainly the science table is projecting our resurgence. So uh, in a nutshell, Dr. Gardner and his team continue to urge, uh, urge us to exercise caution. And certainly from his perspective, there's no clear line of vision in terms of where this pandemic is heading. And that said, uh, you know, I think our control group is very aware that you know, we, we need to continue uh, providing services in as accessible of a manner as possible. And uh, we continue to meet on a biweekly basis uh, with that, Your Worship, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments from, uh, from members of council. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Members of council, do anyone have any questions through to the CAO? Uh, Councillor Badebonker. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I didn't quite catch whether Town Hall and our other facilities are open for walk-in traffic from the members of the public that uh, they don't have to specifically make an appointment. They can just walk in and conduct their business um, at Town Hall and our other facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor Vettaboncourt. Uh, good question. Um, I did, uh, so what I touched on is that we are still by appointment only at our facilities. We are still in our cohort model or our team's model, if I will. Uh, and we still are, uh, we still do have a closure from 12 to one at our facilities. Now that said, nothing has changed uh, over the last uh, I'm going to say five or six weeks, and I think certainly the message that I provided to Council in January was we've not had a situation where we've turned someone away that I'm aware of, or, or if we have, it's it's been uh, those rare circumstances because we just simply haven't had staff available. But uh, we haven't had very many situations, if any, where we've had to turn staff away that haven't had appointments. We've been as accommodating as we possibly can. Uh, that said, we do certainly strongly encourage uh, members of the community to make appointments. And I think we're seeing, you know, a, a good uptake on that. You know, members of the public want to make a, appointments as much as they do, um, you know, at, at many other places that, that they are uh, that needing to. So hopefully that answers the question, uh, Councillor Vadebancourt. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Vadebancourt. Thank you, Worship. So if I understand correctly, people can go to the library, they can go to the museum, they can go to the arena, um, come and go to access those services, but to go to town hall, they 
uh, to undertake a, a service, pay, pay a water bill, which the water bills are out now and are due and the tax bills will be due. They have to make an appointment to do that. The CAO? Through your worship, uh, that is correct. Uh, through to you, Councillor Vadabank, where uh, you, uh, you, you, understand, you, un you understood very clearly what, uh, what I had articulated at, uh, at Town Hall, Public Works Admin, as well as uh, Fire Hall. Councillor Vadabankar, any further? No, no, Your Worship, thank you. Thank you. So with that, there are no further questions through the CAO. So <clears throat> I would ask that a verbal update from the Chief Administrative Officer be received for information, a mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Levy and seconded by Councillor Rose. All in favor? That is carried, thank you. Moving on to B, the Tourist Information Center Operating Hours, RCS 2022-05, that the Tourist Information Center Operating Hour be extended until October 31, uh, mover and a seconder. Councillor Levy, Deputy Mayor Dubo, are there any questions, concerns? None, so all in favor? And that is scary as well, thank you. Now move on to C and uh, we're gonna, that's a good one. Memo to council re-advocacy updates, joint and several liability reform, FIN 2022-02. Whereas municipal governments provide essential services to the residents and businesses in the communities, and whereas the ability to provide those services is negatively impacted, by exponentially rising insurance costs, and whereas one driver of rising insurance costs is the legal principle of joint and several liability, which assigns disproportionate liability to municipalities for an incident relative to their responsibility for it. And whereas the government of Ontario has the authority and the responsibility for the legal framework of joint and several liability, and whereas the Premier of Ontario committed to review the issue in 2018 with a view to helping municipal governments manage and risks and costs. And whereas the Association of Municipalities of Ontario on behalf of municipal governments has provided recommendations in their October 1, 2019 submission to the Attor Attorney General towards a reasonable balance addressing growing municipal liability and insurance costs to align municipal liability with a proportionate responsibility for incidents and capping awards. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Benetangosheen does hereby support AMO's recommendations, and further be it resolved that the town of Benetangosheen does hereby call on the Attorney General of Ontario to work with municipal governments to put forward a plan of action to address joint and several liability before the end of the government's current term so that municipalities can continue to offer high quality service to their communities. So uh, <clears throat> a mover and a seconder on this. Councillor saint and Councillor Vedemonker. Um, before we call the vote, I might point out that uh, yesterday, uh, uh, <clears throat> Deputy Mayor uh, Dubo and myself can attest to the fact that uh, this was a uh, topic uh, at the county level as well, the county council yesterday morning. There was a great deal and length of time spent on this issue and a lot of the member uh, communities uh, bringing up points and different points. And uh, I think one that was brought up, if I recall, Deputy Mayor, was uh, some of the municipalities asking if we could not go out on our own and do our own uh, in, uh, insurance. So it's a very interesting thing, but I think it's something that certainly has to be addressed. So are there any uh, comments or concerns with the... Uh, okay, so all in favor. That is scary, thank you. Moving on to D, a proclamation, Black History Month. Whereas the town of Penetangusheen and Simcoe County's population is becoming increasingly diverse, and it is important that we embrace diversity and foster belonging and inclusion. And whereas making change encourages our community to recognize Black History Month, 
as an opportunity to embrace diversity and to foster belonging and inclusion. And whereas Black History Month is a time to learn about these stories and many important contributions of local Black Canadians to the settlement, growth, and development of Simcoe County and about diversity of Black communities in Canada and their importance to the history of this country. And whereas during Black History Month, Canadians celebrate the many achievements and contributions of Black Canadians who have and continue to do so much to make Canada the culturally diverse nation it is today. Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the Corporation of Town of Penetanguishene do hereby proclaim the month of February 2022 as Black History Month in the town of Penetanguishene. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Mayotte and Councillor Sainama, all in favor? And that is scary. Moving on to presentation and consideration of reports, Committee of the Whole, Committee of the Whole report that the recommendation contained within the Committee of Whole report related to recreation and community services section be approved. Mover and a seconder, Councillor Cummings and Deputy Mayor Dubo, all in favor? Moving on, that the recommendation contained within the Committee of the Whole related to Planning and Development Services section be approved. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Levy, Councillor Wadebonker, any questions, concerns? All in favor? And that is carried. That the recommendations contained within the Community of the Whole report related to the Transportation and Environmental Services section be approved. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Clue and Councillor Mayotte. No, oh, where's, oh yeah, he's there. Uh, uh, any concerns? I actually should, uh, I should say uh, uh, the, the seconder would be Councillor LaRose. Uh, <clears throat> all in favor. That the recommendations contained within committee of the whole report related to the finance and corporate services section be approved. Councillor Sainama and Councillor Mayotte, any questions, concerns? All in favor. And that is scary, thank you. Presentations and consideration of report special committees, there are none. Motions of which notice has been previously given, there are none. Notices of motion from Councillor Jill Thanema, re-nursing shortage with local health systems. That the Town of Penetanguishen Council call on the Ontario government to immediately repeal Bill 124 and complementary amendments to the other legislation made under Bill 124 as a necessary first step to ending the nursing shortage that is compromising the ability of our health system and specifically our local hospitals to re respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and care for those who have contracted COVID-19 and its variants that provincial health systems be requested to review the pay levels applied for permanent nurses in relation to those employed on a temporary basis, and that a copy of the resolution be sent to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, requesting that they share with all the member municipalities and that North Simcoe MPPs requesting their support. And uh, I will certainly second uh, Councillor's uh, motion, Councillor Sainamaw's motion. Uh, are there any questions concerned? Uh, Councillor Sainema, do you may wish to make any comments? Or? Thank you, Your Worship. I think it's it's fairly straightforward and no real comments to be to be added to it unless there's any questions. And I don't see that there are any questions. So that uh, Your Worship, we, we wouldn't have any questions or discussion on this as it's a notice of motion. So we're oh. just moving and seconding it, and it'll appear on uh, the next agenda for voting and, and for any discussion. Very well. And so you have the mover and a seconder. All in favor? And that is carried. Now moving on to 15, consideration of bylaws. So we have bylaw 2022-07, a bylaw to appoint a G4S Secure Solution Canada Limited on Waypoint Centre for mental health care Penetanguishene as municipal law enforcement officer, 2022-08 bylaw amendment to appoint municipal bylaw enforcement officers for the town of Penetanguishene, Leadhan. 
2020-2209 bylaw to appoint the municipal bylaw enforcement officers for the town of Penetanguishene road patrol equipment operator. 2022-10 amend bylaw 2016-45 being a bylaw to authorize execution of an agreement with the Waypoint Center for Mental Health Care here and after Waypoint and G4S Secure Solutions Canada Limited here and after G4S. 2022-11 being a bylaw to authorize the entering into an agreement with the BGC North Simcoe for 2022-25 day camp operations. 2022-12 being a bylaw to establish a pre-servicing agreement with Bay Moorings Marina Holding GP Inc. and Bay Mooring Marina Holdings Limited Partnership 175 and 200 Fox Streets. Uh, 2022-13 being a bylaw to authorize the entering of an agreement with a, a Ramosa Engineering Inc. For, for the provision of SCADA maintenance services for the Water and Wastewater Division for a three-year term. And finally, that the Council of the Town of Penetanguishene in, introduced the following bylaws, 2022-07, 2208, 2209, 2210, 2211, 2212, and 2213. And that bylaws be read at first time and deemed to be read a second time and third time and carried. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Levy and Councillor Cummings, all in favor. And that is carried. We now move on to question period from the media and the public. For your worship, uh, just before we move on to that, I just wanted to uh, clarify um, just from the notice of motion that was read um, because you did call for a vote and I just want to ensure members of council understand uh, again, that notice of motion, the members of the public and the media that might be watching that, that notice of motion is read. It's moved and seconded to allow it to continue. Um, and so that motion will actually go on the next agenda for discussion and a vote. Um, so even though members of council called for a vote and the vote was carried, um, that it's not being recorded as such because that's not a part of our procedure um, and it will appear on the next agenda. I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, clarified for everyone. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Madam Clerk. Okay. And uh, okay, so then question period from media and the public. It appears that there are none. Any announcements or inquiries? Councillor Cummings. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm happy to announce that the 74th annual Winter Rama will be held again this year on February 18th to the 20th. Um, we're offering, they are offering a hybrid model with some programming highlights being like virtually. You can see entertainment such as musicians, musicians, and trivia games. Uh, in person, you can go ice fishing, do some croquis curl, uh, ice sculptures, and there's going to be a snowmobile poker run as well. Um, there are also lots of family options. Um, you pr probably noticed on Facebook, there are ski passes available. There'll be cardboard toboggan races and the um, component, um, in partnership with Rotor Act and Rotary Snow Sculpture Competition, or you can go on a library scavenger hunt. Um, some of these uh, events are going to require registration. So if you need to find out more information, go to our uh, penetang.ca or connect penetang site and uh, find out more information regarding the winter rama. By the way, uh, also we have um, winter rama buttons they are free if you'd like to stop by uh, out any outside town facility or food land, you can pick up your free button. And lastly, the winner of this year's button design contest was Emma Valentine. Very good. And, uh, and, and actually a job well done with the button. It, it, it's a very nice, uh, attractive button. Uh, Councillor Levy. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I would like to announce the retirement of our chief building official, Terry Paquette. He's been our CBO for seven years, but he's retiring after a 30-year career uh, with Midland as well. And uh, we would just, I would just like to ask council uh, in wishing him well in his retirement. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, I'd also like to announce that we have uh, 
our zoning bylaw uh, review coming up, and we have public engagement scheduled for uh, February 15th at 2 p.m. And uh, it will be coming to council for a mandatory public meeting on uh, February 23rd. And I would certainly like, uh, and the obviously the planner has encouraged this as well as well as Councilor Vado and Core that we engage not only council but uh, the general public in this uh, extremely important uh, uh, quest to finalize our zoning bylaw. Uh, so that's my announcements. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Councilor Leading uh, Council. Um, yes, and uh, uh, it uh, with Terry Paquette is that. Uh, I have to uh, remember that uh, when I was uh, in the contracting business, I had uh, dealings with Terry and, and uh, I was, he always carried himself very well and very professional. So I wish him all the best. Uh, with that, I thank you. Are there any further announcements or inquiries? Uh, Councillor Vodemacher. Thank you, Worship. Um, as our uh, representative on the control group, um, I'd like to ask if you wouldn't mind uh, asking the control group to consider uh, opening up town hall for walk-in uh, patrons. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the water bills are due. There are people like to pay uh, those water bills in person. The tax bills are due at the end of the month. Uh, we won't have another council meeting until March. Uh, we have our special public meeting dealing with the zoning bylaw. But uh, I know that members of the public, there are some that like to pay in person and having a town hall open for walk-in traffic to allow that to take place. Um, if the control group could uh, please consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vodemokar. I will relay that on to the CAO. Uh, further questions uh, in regards to any of the concerns of this evening or any further announcements or inquiries? Okay, there being none, then we will go on to the confirmation bylaw and that the confirmation bylaw 2022-14 be signed and sealed by the mayor and clerk. Uh, mover and a seconder. Councillor Cummings and Councillor Mayotte, all in favor? And motion to adjourn. Councillor Cummings, all in favor? And so with that, we are adjourned regular council meeting. Now, is it the wish of council that we move on with the committee of the whole or that we take a break? I can tell you that I could uh, actually use about a five minute break to just stand up. Are we in accordance or in agreement? Yes, thank you very much. So five minute break, Sarah, let us know when it's time to come back.
Hey, council, staff, well, um, welcome back. And uh, we will now move on to our committee of the whole meeting of Wednesday, February 9th, and uh, calling the meeting to order. First up is the approval of the agenda for the committee of the whole. Recommended action that the committee of the whole agenda for February 9th, 2022 be approved as presented. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Vadebonker and Councillor saint -Aman, all in favor? And that is carried. We move on to a declaration of pecuniary interest. If anyone so has, may do so at the moment or at the appropriate time. Uh, presentations and delegations, all sections. So number four, this evening, we have a presentation from J Consulting Group, Jody Ball, Re-Age Friendly Community Plan. Welcome, Jody. Thank you, Your Worship. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, does that look okay, Your Worship? Thank you. So good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of council, staff, and everyone joining this evening. Um, very nice to be here again. My name is Jody Ball. I am very excited on behalf of Jake Consulting to share with you the town's age-friendly community plan. The plan is really an accomplishment of uh, a lot of work, not just of our team, but the commitment and guidance of the Community Wellbeing Committee, town staff, many representatives from community organization and the residents of Penetang Machine who all participated throughout this process. The town's community plan is being funded by the County of Simcoe and the province of Ontario through the Inclusive Community Grant Program. So this evening I'd like to recap with you our process for developing the age-friendly community plan, highlight the vision, principles, and actions that make up this five-year plan. As I get started, I, I do wanna highlight the importance of the work that has been undertaken and the significance of the work that is still to be undertaken. This age-friendly community plan comes at a critical time, as with communities across Canada and indeed globally, we are aging. The senior population in Penetanguishing is expected to continue to grow, reaching approximately 37% by 2031. The United Nations has declared this the decade of healthy aging, bringing together governments, international agencies, professionals, academia, the media, the private sector together to improve the lives of older people, their families, and the communities in which they live. To do this requires a shift in the actions we take and how we think about age and aging. There are four areas for action within the United Way's decade of healthy aging, including age-friendly environments as well as combating ageism, integrated care, and long-term care. So this plan is really an important component in removing physical and social barriers to aging and implementing policies, services, and systems to enable healthy aging for everyone. So how did we get here? We essentially began our process back in May of 2021, where we began conducting our background research and initiating our community engagement process. So between May and June, we conducted our online and telephone surveys, held virtual coffee chats and focus groups, and developed the needs assessment or what we call the current state analysis. Over the summer, we held some community pop-up events at Rotary Park, I saw some of you there, and in September had our virtual visioning workshop. From there, we really got into the development of the plan, framing the vision, principles, and actions, and going back out to the Community Wellbeing Committee, staff, and the community to gather feedback and other ideas. And that work resulted in a final community plan and implementation plan that were prepared in January. So as the senior population across Canadian communities continues to grow, it's more important than ever to support the health and well-being of our older Canadians. So the goal of the Age-Friendly Community Plan is to assess the town's social and physical environment 
using the eight World Health Organization dimensions of community life and identifying priority areas for meeting the needs of an aging population. So some of you might remember this slide um, from when we presented back in June, but I thought I would put it up again for a moment to remind us of our framework for developing the Penetanguishing Age-Friendly Plan. This framework is based on the World Health Organization's eight dimensions of an age-friendly community. These eight dimensions are illustrated on the wheel that you can hopefully see on your screen. And so through our research and our engagement, we have been focused on defining the strengths, the challenges and opportunities within each of these eight areas of community life. So there are two um, key areas of research uh, to inform the development of the plan. The first was our background research, which comprised a review of existing policy documents, data, um, demographic, as well as some age-friendly and health indicators and looking at best practices from other jurisdictions. So for context, some of the pieces we did look at was the World Health Organization Global Age-Friendly Cities Guide. So that was a, an important document for, for this project, as well as the Age-Friendly Communities in Canada Community Implementation Guide. Um, there's a number of provincial documents we looked at as well, including um, creating a more inclusive Ontario age-friendly planning guide for municipalities and community organizations, which was updated last year, just before we began actually. We looked at some county level plans as well, including the county's positive aging strategy, and then of course, municipal planning documents, um, such as the Recreation and Community Services Master Plan, Official Plan, Community Strategic Plan, Cycling Strategy, Multi-Year Accessibility Plan, and the Arena and Recreation Study. So the second piece of our research is that community engagement program where we completed a number of consultation activities to inform the age-friendly plan. The first was the web page, so getting information out to let people know about the study, uh, how they can participate. Um, this was launched back in May when we first began. Through the month of June, which is Seniors Month, we completed a community-wide telephone and online survey. We completed surveys with 155 seniors, and a, an additional 130 uh, residents completed the online survey. We also conducted two community coffee chats virtually, uh, as well as a stakeholder focus group in the month of May. The stakeholder session was aimed at reaching out to targeted stakeholder groups, such as service providers, community clubs, and associations. And we held a focus group as well with the Community Wellbeing Committee. We also conducted several telephone interviews with various stakeholders and staff. As I mentioned, um, I was able to do a bit of in-person engagement um, back in July at the All Things Canadian Festival and chatted with people there about their thoughts about age friendliness and penetanguishing. We also had two workshops as part of this project. The first was our visioning workshop in September and the second was our strategic planning workshop held in November. I wanted to also share this illustration. At our community visioning workshop in September, we had a graphic facilitator attend, Patricia Cambich. And through that session and through the breakout room discussions, key themes emerged um, that highlight all eight areas of an age-friendly community and really provided us um, from the community with a jumping off point to develop the community plan. So based on our research and what we've learned, what we heard through the planning process from the community and through discussions with staff and the Community Wellbeing Committee, using our experience and lessons learned from other jurisdictions, we have prepared the age-friendly community plan, including vision, principles, and actions. As a vision, we are a community for people of all ages and abilities. Principles that were defined include inclusive, so respect and support for all residents at all stages of life, collaborative, committed partners working together with a shared responsibility to achieving the vision of this plan, accessible, an accessible system of supports meeting the diverse physical, health, cognitive and mental health and social needs of all individuals, and accountable, responsible to report back to our community and responsive to changing needs and priorities. 
So in keeping with the World Health Organization age-friendly framework, the actions outlined with the Penetang Machines age-friendly plan have been grouped under each of those eight dimensions. There are a total of 30 recommendations within the plan. Um, they are diverse actions that are all aimed at creating a more age-friendly community where all residents are active and engaged members of the community at every stage of life. Importantly, by planning for the needs of our older population, age-friendly communities are designed to better meet the needs of all residents. The actions defined in the plan put forward a series of strategies that the town, with the support of community partners, can implement to help support residents' health and well-being. Importantly, realizing the age-friendly vision for the town of Penetanguishene requires the collective efforts of a broad range of stakeholders to come together to implement the recommended actions and ultimately work towards becoming a more age-friendly community for all residents. The town has taken a strong leadership role in initiating the development of this plan. We also know the importance that senior levels of governments can play, including the province in establishing a framework for age-friendly planning, as well as um, providing some funding for age-friendly initiatives. Of course, the county has an important role in a number of age-friendly dimensions, including but not limited to housing and transportation. There's also the recently established North Simcoe Age-Friendly Collaborative, looking at ways to leverage resources to support age-friendly actions across the area. Our community partners, local businesses, all have a role in providing accessible and inclusive community services and spaces. And therefore, an important element of achieving a more age-friendly community is the coordination of this collective action. Just one other slide. I do want to highlight some further recommendations that are outlined within the plan. So in addition to um, the 30 recommendations, um, really to support the full achievement of the plan and working again towards becoming a more age-friendly community, it's also suggested that an age-friendly coordinator role be established within the town. And this may be established as a new or part-time or contract position or as part of an existing role. And really that role is to act as a liaison with staff, the community well-being committee, community partners, including neighboring municipalities and the county of Simcoe in implementing the actions of this plan. Might also include supporting communication of the age-friendly plan, pursuing funding opportunities and conducting research and assisting in the planning and coordination of age-friendly events and activities. It's also recommended that the Community Wellbeing Committee continue to support the overall leadership and monitoring of the town's age-friendly community action plan, that the town and the community wellbeing lead the preparation of an annual age-friendly report card to share successes and identify continued priorities for the community, to conduct a full review of the community action plan in 2026, and finally, that the town join Ontario's network of age-friendly community initiatives. So also of importance as part of carrying out this plan, an implementation plan has been developed to support the achievement of the plan. It's meant to be a living document. It puts forward action leads, our suggestions for partners, timelines, and potential resource considerations. So I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to present the Age-Friendly Community Plan and to congratulate the town of Penetang Machine in taking important steps to develop this plan and working towards becoming an age-friendly community. Thank you, Jody. And I would ask members of council if anyone has any questions through to Jody. Uh, Councillor Lederbacher. Thank you, Worship. A uh, question with respect to um, partnerships with other communities. Um, it would seem that a lot of what you've talked about, and it was a very good presentation, uh, by the way, is uh, are applicable to the other municipalities in, in this geography, Tiny, K, Midland. Um, did you look at opportunities to uh, partner and share some of the um, some of the strategies with these other communities and, and look to see if we can achieve some economies of scale. Thank you for the question, Councillor Vadavankar. Um, I would say that we have um, 
noted the um, North Simcoe uh, group that's recently come together as a potential partner. The actions themselves are put forward as actions for the town of Penetanguishing, but certainly there are absolutely opportunities to work with neighboring municipalities. And I would point to things like um, the recommendations around transportation, um, certainly around the sharing of information, um, access to health services. Those would be some areas where I would think um, partnerships with your neighboring municipalities would be um, definitely advantageous and recommended. Thank you. Further questions, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wondered, will this be available to the public? Will it be the document placed on our website so that people could um, have a look at it? Um, yes, Deputy Mayor. Um, it's my understanding that it will be available. I hope it's available. There is also um, a snapshot, I guess, of those eight dimensions of an age-friendly community that has been on the website. Um, but yes, I, I believe the plan will be posted there. Very good, thank you. I see that uh, Clerk uh, Cooper uh, has come on and probably can clarify. Stacey, yeah, please. I just, absolutely, I just wanna clarify that absolutely will be posted. It, a lot of the, the details regarding this plan and the process leading up to it is, is actually listed on our Connect Penetanguishing site where we uh, gave all of our residents an opportunity to sort of see it come to fruition and comment and participate. Um, so it's somewhere where we'll be posting it there, but we will also be um, doing a full uh, release about it and uh, through our communication channels um, to make sure everyone's aware. Very Thank good. you. Uh, Councillor Levy. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to Jody, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, something that has uh, happened in recent uh, month, weeks and months is I've had several, oh, many seniors reach out to me with the difficulty of maintaining their home uh, that they would like to sell. They would like to rent a place. Rents are unaffordable currently. And their major issues are uh, not hiring contractors per se, but having someone available that could come over and change a light bulb in the kitchen or, you know, stand on a ladder that they can't stand on and uh, other, other safety issues and issues of seniors in, in poorer health maintaining their home. Um, I, I, I was just wondering if there's been any discussion about a neighbor helping neighbor program and a registry that could assist those of us struggling to maintain homes. Um, I'll just throw it out there and see if there's been any of that kind of discussion. Yeah, thank you for the, the comment and the question, Councillor Levy. Um, I know one of the recommendations within the plan does look at creating greater access to in-home supports, which may include um, not necessarily um, uh, comprehensive um, in-home services, but like you suggest, um, maybe a little bit of help around the house. So there is a, a placeholder for that in the plan. I will say that other um, communities do look at um, volunteer led programs. Often they are led by a community organization, but maybe supported by a municipality, perhaps um, through communication, perhaps through um, a little bit of funding. Um, I also know one of the directions within uh, the Penetanguishing plan is around um, supporting seniors um, with alternative transportation options. And those um, volunteer-led um, driving programs might be something that would help there as well. Thank you very much, Jody. My, my specific uh, request is to look at just helping with minor tasks around the house, house whether it be helping putting your bins out in mm -hmm. half a foot of snow or just things that uh, so many seniors are, are not capable of, of doing, and yet they have to do them. And just, it's a matter of keeping people safe in their homes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Further questions through to Jody? That appears none. Jody, thank you again for a presentation well prepared and well done. I appreciate it and have a good evening. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you. Okay, moving on to the council information package. Council information package of January 19, 22 and February 2, 22. The recommended action is that the council information package having been given due consideration be received for information. Does anyone have any uh, uh, to pull or discuss? The mover and a seconder. Councillor Cummings and Councillor Mayotte, all in favor. That is carried, thank you. We move on now to six, Section A, Transportation Environmental Services, and I will turn it over to Councillor Clue. Thank you, Your Worship. Oh, great, one moment. Okay, the first item on our consent agenda is the Midland Penetang Machine Transit Ridership Quarterly Update. The recommended action is that the following consent agenda item, having been given due consideration, be received for information. Do we have a mover and a seconder for this item? Councillor Cummings, Councillor Rose, is there any discussion, any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. We have no matters for consideration this evening, and so we move on to our referrals. We have two items on our referrals. We have 2022 budget requests for road work at Robert Street East and Dufferin, as well as the stormwater management best practices and engineering standards later this year. The, rec the recommended action is that the transportation and environmental services section endorse the following additional and existing referrals to upcoming agendas and staff. Do we have anything to remove or anything to add? Any discussion? I see none. Do we have a mover and a seconder? For that motion, Councillor Rose and Councillor Sanema, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. And finally, our question period for media and public. I don't believe we have anybody. Uh, and so I will turn it back to you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Clue. And with that, we'll move on to seven, Section B, Recreation and Community Services. And I will pass it over to Councillor Cummings. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we have four items on our consent agenda this evening. Uh, the Penetang Public Library minutes of January and February, our Museum and Heritage Committee minutes of October 14th, the Penetang Curling Club minutes of January 18th, and a memo to council read the Friends of the Penetang Youth BMX Pump Track donation. Uh, the recommended action here is that the following consent agenda items having been given due consideration be received for information. I need a mover. And a seconder, Councillor Rose, seconded Councillor Sanema. Is there any discussion regarding Deputy Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, wanted to give a shout out to the Friends of Penetang Machine Youth and how uh, hard they're all working towards raising dollars to help us with uh, different recreational facilities throughout the municipality. So. Kudos to them and kudos to uh, Marilyn Belil, who has worked tirelessly at uh, keeping everybody motivated and continuing to raise money. So just uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just thought it would be a good thing uh, to give a shout out to the ladies that are working very hard. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I echo the same uh, comments about what that group has been doing for a rotary wind at park and everything in town. So uh, congratulations to them. I'm gonna call for the vote. Uh, all those in favor? That is carried, thank you. Our matter, under our matters for consideration, uh, we've heard a excellent presentation from Jody Ball. Um, the recommended action here is that the age-friendly plan as presented as attachments one and two of this report be adopted by the town of Penetanguishene, and that staff use the plan as a guiding document for policy development, program inflammation, and infrastructure improvements in the town of Penetanguishene. And further let changes to the operating and capital budgets be brought forward during future budget deliberations for council consideration. Do I have a mover? Uh, Councillor Sanama, second to Councillor Levy. Is there any discussion on this matter? Councillor Sanama. 
Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cummings. I just wanted to, to say as the chair of the Community Wellbeing Committee, um, we're very excited about the, about the plan. Um, I think, like, I know a lot of work has gone into it. And with the permission of the chair, I was going to ask if we, I could let um, one of our members just have a couple of words to share with, the, uh, with council would be uh, Benita Durush, is she's a member of the of the committee. So if it's... Um, I'm gonna to refer to the clerk on this. Is that uh, uh, allowed at this time? Absolutely. Uh, is, it's basically your, your choice as the chair to allow it. I think Councillor Sanama just wants to share the enthusiasm of one of our committee members uh, about oh, and this. I know how enthusiastic yeah, Benita it's, is, so. It's absolutely, <laughs> it's absolutely your call. Absolutely. Yeah. By all means, Benita, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Cummings and uh, Mayor LaRue, Deputy Mayor Dubo, and members of council. Um, I'm Benita Drush, and I am one of eight members uh, of the Community Wellbeing Committee. And I am the fr francophone representation, uh, but this committee is stacked with um, lots of depth. So we have representation from the seniors. We have uh, a young gal as a youth rep. We have indigenous uh, representation. And we also have um, a resident from the previous town accessibility committee. So lots of expertise and um, lots of, um, of certainly well-intended um, direction. It's my pleasure to be here today to speak on behalf of the committee on the Penetanguishians proposed age-friendly community plan. We are so pleased to see this before council since this plan provides a vision and next steps to improve the well-being of residents and um, meeting the increasing needs of our, as you know, of our growing po aging population. This is really a, a made in Penetanguishine plan by Penetanguishine and for Penetanguishine. So again, uh, congrats to everyone involved. Um, it, it really gives us a, a roadmap um, to the plan's vision. The plan's vision is a community for all ages and abilities. And although this aging plan, this um, community aging plan is axed on seniors, uh, by looking at the actions, there's 30 actions in this plan. So by looking at these actions, they're all based on the eight domains from um, the World Health Organization, and those are transportation, um, their uh, public spaces and whatnot. And so all of these actions actually improve all of those features in a place that don't only matter to seniors, but they matter to everyone in a community so that the community becomes more inclusive and more accessible. So again, what a great tool in our box as far as moving Penetanguishine forward in making it a, a more resident friendly space. Uh, that being said, I'm also here on behalf of the committee to say that we are ready to roll up our sleeves and dig into this master plan. That's exactly uh, what we want to do as residents of the town of Penetanguishene and as volunteers of the town of Penetanguishene. We don't only want to say, yes, we love this program and uh, yes, please get more staff and please get more budget. And we're really happy. We'll see how it all turns out. We're ready to roll up our sleeves and to take on uh, a lot of those domains and bring them along so that this plan continues to remain a made in a Penetanguishene plan for and by residents. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to speak this evening and uh, I wish you well in your deliberations. Thank you, Benita. I know you will put 150% into this for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, having said that, I'm gonna call for the vote. All those in favor? I'll put my vote in there. That's carried. Thank you very much. We have no referrals tonight. Um, so the question period from the media and public and I don't see the media or the public, so I'm going to turn it back to you, Your Worship. You're on mute. I have to repeat it all, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Council Cummings. Uh, we'll move on to Section C, Planning and Community Development Services, and with that, I'll pass it on to Councillor Levy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, we have three items on the consent agenda. Uh, bylaw monthly activity reports for December and January. Uh, that's 2021 and January 2022. We have Hir Huronia Animal Control monthly comparative report. And we have a memo to council, re Queens Court official plan appeal case management conference, January 21, 22. And uh, I just wanted to ask if council had anything they want pulled for discussion on the consent agenda. Seeing none, I will call for a mover, Councillor Cummings and a seconder, Councillor LaRose. And we'll call for the vote, all in favor. And that is carried, thank you very much. Matters for consideration. Number one, Water Street Community Improvement Plan Application Refusal recommended action that the application for the signage improvement program under the town of Penetanguishing Community Improvement Plan for the property at One Water Street be refused. I will ask for our director of planning, Andrea Betty, to uh, address this issue. Andrea, if you would. Oh, I Thank don't see you. Andrea. Oh, there she is. Sorry, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Levy. My camera is not, uh, or my signal's not working very well right now, so I'm gonna keep my camera off. Um, That's okay, we know what you look like. <laughs> so you do have the staff report in front of you. We received uh, an application to our community improvement plan last year. It was under the signage of improvement program and through our uh, consideration of the application, we did not feel it met the intent and purpose and the guidelines. And so we recommended some changes to improve the application. And um, without any changes, we refuse the application. So under the administration of the CIP, a final decision from council is to be made if there was uh, any appeal from the applicant and the town did receive an appeal package. That's also part of the staff report. So um, the details are in, in the report about the refusal and the, the policies of the CIP, why we felt it didn't meet it. Um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. For, first of all, I would... Uh call for a mover on this and a seconder to get it on the floor. Do I have a mover? Councillor Vadavancourt, seconded by Deputy Mayor Dubo. Are there any questions uh, relating to this report? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? And that is duly carried. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to site plan application, SPA 2107. 9795 County Road 93, uh, Plan 2022 08, recommended action that site appro plan approval be granted for the property at 9795 County Road 93, in keeping with staff report PL 2022 08. Uh, Andrew, you might as well give us uh, a uh, quick rundown on why this is coming as. Uh, a site plan, et cetera. The, basically the questions I asked you yesterday at uh, section, if you would please. Certainly, thank you very much, Councillor Levy. So this is an, an application for site plan approval. Uh, the owners of the properties did apply for and receive consent to sever off uh, the rear half of the property, which fronts onto Murray Road. Part of the reporting that was done is to support their consent application identified um, impacts from environmental features nearby. And so recommendations about how the development of this property uh, could occur while respecting the natural heritage features. So through that, the committee imposed a condition um, that they receive site plan approval to ensure that the lot development uh, uh, follows that plan in accordance. So uh, the site plan was reviewed by staff and is being brought forward for council for approval. Very good, thank you very much. Uh, I would call for a uh, mover and a seconder for this to get it on the floor. Uh, Councillor Vadavancor moving and Councillor St. Amant seconding. Any discussion, questions, clarifications required? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? And that is duly carried. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to uh, our planner for that. And uh, the third item here is local climate change action plan update and declaring a climate emergency recommended action, whereas the United Nations 
IPCC 2021 report, global warming of 1.5 centigrade states, the urgency of keeping global heating below the 1.5 goal, and also acknowledges that the world is currently on track for more than three degrees centigrade increase in temperature rise based on policies that are now in place. And whereas this current track of climate heating will lead to catastrophic social, economic, cultural, and environmental impacts on our community and elsewhere, and that the IPCC estimates less than 10 years to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And whereas, whereas many municipalities across Ontario and Canada understand the major benefits of and the need to be at the forefront of action on climate change, with many having declared a climate emergency already, including the Township of Georgian Bay and the District of Muskoka. And whereas much of the financial damage associated with climate change will come from impacts to municipal core infrastructure, such as road, bridges, water, wastewater, and stormwater systems, and from destruction of natural infrastructure, impacts to tourism and farming. And whereas, whereas it is necessary not only to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also to increase community resiliency in the face of climate change, and that these approaches can offer multiple benefits, including improved health and air quality, increased innovation, economic development, and reduced costs in the long run. And whereas many people in the region have demonstrated a strong interest and commitment to address climate change and continue to make the region a leader in environmental action and protection. And whereas the town of Penetanguishim has adopted a local climate change action plan and adopted the goals of corporate GHG emissions reduction of 25% by 2028 and community GHG emissions reduction of 6% by 2028 in line with their commitment to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Partners for Climate Protection Program. And whereas numerous, oh my goodness, and whereas numerous municipal official and strategic plans outline the environment as a priority, including sustainability, preserva preservation of our natural heritage and resilience to climate change, now, therefore, it be resolved that the town of Penetanguishing officially declare a climate emergency immediately and join other mun municipalities to name and deepen the commitment to protecting our economy, our community, our ecosystems from impacts of climate heating and continue to work on, carry out and achieve actions, priority and goals outlined in the local climate change action plan recommit support and participation in the Municipal Climate Leadership Committee, which will further amplify support for the LCCAP and will assist in the regular review and updating of the MCAP and the LCCAP as science evolves and collaborate with the County of Simcoe, the Severn Sound Environmental Association, other municipal governments, institutions, industry associations, and the community to improve standards and protocols that can positively address climate adaption and mitigation and seek the secure funding opportunities from both internal and external sources for 2021 and beyond to adequately <coughs> excuse me, finance climate actions necessary to meet 2028 emissions reduction targets commit to putting climate action on the forefront of all decision-making, large and small, working to achieve community well-being and resiliency, equity, reconciliation, and leaving no one behind, and work with other community stakeholders to educate the public at large about steps that can be taken by individuals and businesses to reduce GHGs and urge both provincial, federal governments, and opposition parties to work rapidly to deliver the GHG emissions reductions needed to keep global heating below the 1.5 centigrade goal to minimize 
life-threatening impacts of climate change. Forward the resolution to the Premier of Ontario, the Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, Simcoe North Representatives, the Honourable Jill Dentlop, MPP, and all Honourable Adam Chambers, MP, and the leaders of the other political parties. Whew, please don't ask me to repeat that. Good heavens. Anyway, a very worthwhile cause, something that our planner and uh, your chair of planning believe in very, very strongly. And uh, I don't know if we need to have Andrea speak to this, but uh, I know she's very pleased to bring this forward to me. So I will ask for a mover on this. Uh, Deputy Mayor Anita Dubo and Councillor Clue. Are there any questions, discussion? <laughs> Deputy Mayor, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to point out that through the Severn Sound Environmental Association and Sustainable Severn Sound, the town of Penetang Machine has done very well in the greenhouse gas emissions. We've cut our emissions. I think we're the best community in North Simcoe. We've come a long way. And I just wanted to, to mention that I think that our uh, planner and also our public works people have been very involved in this process. So very, very pleased to see this. I think uh, climate change is here and we all need to remember as we uh, proceed with infrastructure and other things that we take all of this into account. At one time we plan for 100 year storms. Now we're looking at 200 year storms, which is extremely unfortunate, but municipalities do have to keep all that in mind. So I just wanted to give a shout out. I think we've done very well and hopefully we will continue to move forward with uh, our emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. And thank you so much for reminding me about how Penetanguishin has done better than all the municipalities in the area. And uh, we discussed that yesterday and our uh, Madam Planner has uh, explained that uh, looking through what we've done and how we've done it, it's uh, buying uh, more uh, vehicles that are easier on gas and uh, uh, the operating of the uh, sewage treatment plant. Uh, and uh, that's something to be really proud of. Doesn't mean we let our guard down, but it's something to be very proud of. And my dog, as some of you might be able to hear, agrees completely. Um, so where was I? We have a mover, we have a seconder. Do we have any other questions? Okay, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor? I will happily put my card up on that. And that is Carrie. Thank you very, very much, Council. And, oh, Sandy. Um, so we move on to referrals. We have uh, two. We have the regulation and licensing options for short-term rentals and the below drive road options. Do I have uh, a mover and seconder for those? That would be Councillor Vadaboncor and Councillor Saint Amant. Um, and all in favor, please. And that is carried. With that, questions from uh, media and public? I don't believe we have any. Uh, and I will hand that back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Levy. Uh, maybe uh, you should look at the, feeding that little dog. Because I'm really hungry. <laughs> so, uh, with that, we'll move it on to nine section B, finance and corporate services, and we pass it on to Councillor Sainema. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, under consent agenda, 
we the recommended I recommended action that the following consent agenda items have been get, haven't been given due consideration be received for information. Um, and it's a, a memo to council regarding an update uh, regarding the CNCC policing costs. Um, if I could have a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Mayotte. Seconder, Councillor Cummings. Um, any discussion? Any questions? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Thank you, so moved. Under uh, matters for consideration, we do have a, a couple of verbal updates from our C CAO. Um, I will ask for a mover and a seconder, and then we'll ask the CAO to make his comments. So thank you, Councillor Mayotte. Uh, you're moving the recommended action that the council receive the County of Simcoe Fire Service Review reports for information. Uh, so Councillor Mayotte is our mover, uh, Councillor Cummings is seconder. And Mr. CAO, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Um, what, what you have in front of you on the agenda uh, under this particular item is six different documents. Uh, I think the documents are fairly self-explanatory, but ultimately it gives council and, and the community a little bit of a picture in terms of how the fire review has uh, kind of come along uh, at the county. As council is aware, uh, the county through a regional government review task force uh, was given direction from county council to review a number of services. I think it was nine or 10, if I recall. Uh, and certainly what we're seeing here is uh, kind of the beginning of a number of those service reviews being completed. In this particular case, uh, what, what you have is uh, the final report from a fire perspective. Uh, there's a number of different opportunities that are identified in there, as well as there's a, a couple different attachments. Uh, there's a copy of the presentation that was given to the Regional Government Review Task Force at the county made up of um, a number of a handful of county councillors uh, and then uh, certainly uh, kind of the most recent staff report if you will uh, that came to the task force by county staff on December the 6th. What the county is asking for uh, in uh, essentially from the local municipalities is feedback uh, from uh, from the respective councils on uh, on the opportunities and and how involved and engaged the municipalities want to be. So what I the purpose of providing uh, it this evening and and uh, being a verbal report was uh, simply because it it all has kind of come together fairly recently from the county looking for feedback. Uh, what I'd like to suggest and certainly from staff's perspective. Uh, what our plan is, is to return to March 9th council, uh, this council, and uh, with, a, with a staff report uh, that essentially encompasses um, a number of different components and uh, giving some uh, perspectives from staff to council on how uh, and what feedback we might provide to the county following that March 9th council meeting. So I'm not looking for any direction although if council has direction certainly we would uh, you know we're here to take direction from council um, but uh, the goal with this was to provide it well in advance of March 9th uh, the fire chief will be working on a staff report on March 9th uh, that uh, you know we'll have a you know more meat and potatoes if you will uh, with the end goal of uh, seeking council direction to provide to the county task force uh, madam chair I think that's really what I wanted to share and I'd be happy to take any questions Thank you very much, Mr. CAO. Uh, are there any questions from council? Seeing none, then I'll call for the vote, please. All those in favor? Okay, very good. Thank you for that information. Um, and then we will go on to the a verbal, another uh, verbal update. Um, recommended, recommended action that the council receive the County of Simcoe Water and Wastewater Service Review Reports for information. Uh, if I could have a mover and a seconder. Councillor Mayotte, Councillor LaRose, Mr. CAO, if you want to do a, a quick update or if there's any questions, thank you. Great, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, very similar uh, to the prior item, this again, water and wastewater was one of uh, nine or 10 services that the county reviewed. 
Uh, what you have in front of you on the agenda is two documents, essentially the final report uh, done by R.V. Anderson and Associates, uh, who was uh, hired by the county, as well as a copy of the presentation that they made to the task force fairly recently. Uh, there's not been any direction from the task force at the county level to uh, seek input from the lower tier municipalities. Uh, certainly from my perspective, I anticipate that that uh, very well might happen in the near future. Uh, and so from uh, from our perspective, we intend on doing the very same thing, uh, returning to Council on March the 9th with a report uh, that our uh, Director of Public Works uh, will, uh, will author, uh, again, seeking some direction from Council that we can provide to the county's task force. Again, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. CEO. Um, any questions from Council? Seeing none, then I will call for the vote. All those in favor? And so moved. Thank you very much. Um, item number three is uh, 2022 Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund um, the, uh, Allocation FIN 2022 03. The recommended action is that the 2022 increased OCIF allocation in the amount of $629,116 be shared between wastewater and public works for roads infrastructure as outlined under option one within this report. If I could have a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Mayotte. Councillor Vadimoncour, um, any questions? Any Don't see any questions. Um, oh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. With the allocation, um, will we be given an opportunity to look at the budget as far as what's allocated in uh, the coming year and perhaps if this money is allocated to 2023 and beyond, will council be given an opportunity to uh, look at what's proposed and maybe make suggestions? Um, I, I will direct that to um, our treasurer. They just, the, from what I, I'll, I'll let the treasurer answer the question. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you, Gary. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Carrie, please. Sorry, my, my, uh, my video's not working. Um, um, through you, Madam Chair, to Deputy Mayor Dubo, uh, are, are you referring to the 2022 allocation or the future, uh, the future year's um, increased allocation? Because the envelope has double, doubled and, and should continue for five years, so the province is telling us. So are you referring to future um, Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund allocations for 2023 and beyond? Yes. So historically with, with those types of annual funding allocations, um, OSIF included, but also as far as federal gas tax funding, um, certainly through staff's presentation of the draft budget that is presented to uh, committee um, th uh, at the beginning of, of every annual budget process. Mm -hmm. um, we, staff would recommend um, which projects and how to fund our capital plan using those sources of funds because of eligibility requirements and so on. But absolutely that after draft one, it's out of our hands and council can suggest or, or direct or recommend uh, that we do we do anything else with those subsidy funds okay. within within, prog okay. within program guidelines? Yeah, for sure. Thank you uh, very much, Carrie, for that. Uh, just uh, it is the, we do have an opportunity to discuss it, uh, this at a further date. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Madam De Treasurer, and also Madam Deputy Mayor. Any other? Questions or concerns? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor? Very good, thank you, so moved. Uh, referrals to upcoming agenda. 
Um, upcoming agenda and staff, sorry, glasses need adjusting. Um, referrals at the finance and corporate services section endorse the following additional and existing referrals to upcoming agendas and staff. And the items are including the OPP, policing costs, CNCC recovery. And that is an ongoing. Any additions or takeaways? If I could have a mover and a seconder for the referrals, Councillor Mayotte, Councillor Cummings. All those in favor? Thank you very much. So moved. Um, questions from the media and the public? Seeing none, I will pass it back to you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Saint-Amand. And with that, that concludes